stage is Jimmy Angelakos about using PostgreSQL with bibliographic, uh, bibliographic data. Please go ahead. Hello. This is a topic which doesn't appear often in Fosnet, and it didn't appear in uh, any of the recent PGCONFs either, because it's something that only librarians care about. Do we have any librarians here? <laughs> More than I expected. Um, please do not be offended by what you will hear about librarians and uh, their relationship with technology. <laughs> So, uh, this is going to be a mostly practical talk, and it's very hands-on. It's not very much about theory or the features of Postgres, and it's not even about the last version of Postgres. Uh, it, work, it should work on 9.4. <coughs> but we're going to look at some ways to circumvent the monopoly that some companies have on bibliographic software, which... Uh, some companies uh, have perhaps 90% of the market share uh, in libraries. And perhaps we can use Postgres to change that. With some, some hacker might start a project based on what he hears here, this, uh, on what he hears here today, which might be good. And <laughs> it might be something uh, equally as bad as what we have now because bibliographic software is generally bad. So what is bibliography? It's the study of books. It's, uh, it's become part of library, what we call now library and information science. And uh, we have some types of bibliography. One is enumerative, which is the part we're going to look, be looking at today, which is basically cataloging the books that we have in our library. And putting them into categories uh, and topics. And descriptive is uh, the part of bibliography that, and librarianship which deals with where an actual physical object is and what its attributes are. For example, that it's bound in leather or it's the third edition of 1979. So how do we keep this data somewhere? We create bibliographic records, which is also known as metadata. And this is where the term metadata actually came from. And we started to use it in technological uh, context and uh, on the internet. So what do we keep for each book <coughs> or whatever we want to catalog? We keep the name of the author, of course, the title, uh, a subject heading, maybe some keywords. And this is all stuff that used to be written down on index cards and uh, now is actually available online on online systems such as bibliographic databases. This doesn't mean that they're the databases we're used to. They're not just databases you can query with SQL, for example. Uh, librarians have their own uh, query languages and they have their own formats which uh, might seem alien to us, but they make pretty good sense for their line of work. So in the 60s, we started having machine-readable records. And uh, the Library of Congress actually specified a format which is called MARC. And MARC is machine-readable cataloging, very imaginatively titled. And, uh, as it started being implemented in the 60s, you can imagine that it's not a technology that's made for the web. There was an attempt by uh, the Library of Congress and some other groups to update the standard in 1999, and they called it Mark for the 21st century. So it's now Mark 21. Uh, on the next page, we'll see what their vision of the 21st century was. It's a very strange format. It's a text format with no delimiters that are actually usable. For example, it's not even usable as a CSV format. It's a strange text with control fields and data fields which are different, and they're all titled by numeric codes. 
and you have to look up the documentation at the Library of Congress to find out what each numeric code stands for. And uh, after the numeric code, we have indicators for each field. And the indicators modify the functionality of the field. So if you have an indicator of 1 or 9 before the field, it means something else. And then we have subfields. Subfields can be, uh, can be repeated inside a field. So you can have, for example, a field with the numeric code of 001, uh, sorry, 049, let's say. And it could have multiple subfields titled A. So this isn't a format we can really work with easily. And, uh, oh, did I mention that the white space has significance? So you can have strings which start with five spaces and have ten more in the middle. And they all mean something. This is the lovely Mark 21 for the first century, the 21st century. And it starts with a header called leader, which means something. I have to make clear, I'm not a librarian, and I, I've only been playing with this for, uh, I don't know, maybe six months. So if I say anything very inaccurate, please forgive me. So on the top, we have the control fields, which don't have subfields. And then we have the data fields with this, these dollar signs, which signify that uh, a subfield is about to start. It's basically indecipherable. It's not human readable. That's why they call it machine readable cataloging. And um, we can see some strange things here, such as that we have three instances of the 210 field, which is one of the title fields, according to Mark. So an attempt was made to make sense out of this format and bring it to uh, something closer that we can use. And uh, Mark XML was created. It's nearly as bad as Mark 21. The worst thing about Mark XML is it's, it's, it is a standard, but it's not being treated as a standard. So you can have commercial software which doesn't respect the format. And uh, brace for impact. This is what Mark XML looks like. You have collections, which are subject headings. And inside the collections, how do you know it's a subject? You have the ID up here, which is the subject heading. And uh, inside them, you have records, which contain control fields, which are marked control field, and data fields, which are marked data field with the word data field. And you can see that there's a lot of wasted effort and wasted space here. And you have, uh, librarians also care about the order of fields, which is bad for us, because uh, as we'll see later on, our JSON-B type doesn't respect order. So, here we have a data field which contains two subfields which should be in this order. Right here, it doesn't matter because one of them is subfield A and the other one is subfield 2. But if we had two subfields called A, then the order would matter because you would be reconstructing the title the wrong way around. So let's put this aside for a while and look at what serials are. Serials are not numbers in this context. Serials are a series of publications that are issued under the same title. So it covers academic journals, periodicals, newspapers, newsletters, and magazines, things that are published in a regular or irregular uh, fashion and have no fixed end to their publication. So we can have them in electronic form as PDFs perhaps or some other format, and we can have them printed as we have had for decades. Their basic identifier is the ISSN, which is, you know what the ISBN is for books, I guess. It's the uh, 
equivalent name for cereals. So I work at the University of Edinburgh at a department called the DINA, which is a national data center for the UK. And it started being one in 1996. We just celebrated Adina's 28th anniversary. And uh, it started, this department started as the University of Edinburgh, Edinburgh Data Library in 1983. And uh, one of their first re relevant projects was Salser in 1994, which was uh, a web interface to actually search through the serials of the Scottish academic libraries, university libraries for uh, publications. And the offspring of Salser is SOMCAT, is the serials union catalog for the UK, which contains all of the serials published in the UK and has materials from 103 libraries, the National Library of Scotland, the National Library of Wales, and university libraries from the UK. Now, why is this important? This is important because you have to compile 103 different lists of metadata from libraries in different formats, which are not really compatible because every librarian uses Mark as he sees fit. So you have to have manual intervention before the creation of the Mark XML file. So for, to help this manual intervention, SunCap depends on some proprietary software and some open source software. The proprietary part is Ex Libris Aleph, and which has a huge market share in uh, the library world, but it requires, or, and it doesn't even produce valid Mark XML. If, a field is longer than it should be according to the developers of Aleph, then it gets truncated and the XML gets truncated as well. Even if you were in the middle of an attribute or a data field or uh, a tag. So after the Mark XML is sanitized for use in SunCat, and how does SunCat use it? It uses a solar database to index this whole thing so you can search through the serials catalog of the UK. Um, after that, the output which is sanitized gets fed into uh, Zebra, a, da a bibli bibliographic database made by Index Data, which is open source. But it only has a few developers that actually understand what's going on under the hood. So it's not a very useful open source project for a start to base your code on. And it also uh, functions as a Z3950 server, which is the query language that you have to use to find out what's going on inside this database. And Z3950 is a very old uh, plain text protocol, which unfortunately is still being used and will keep being used until something supersedes it and gets adopted by the majority of libraries which is not anytime soon. Uh, some possible replacements are SRU and SRW, which are twin formats. One of them works as REST, and the other one works as SOAP, which means that nobody uses it anymore. <laughs> Let's take a look at how Postgres can help us with this mess. We have the new JSONB data type, which I'm not going to talk about because I think you've heard enough about it in the past few months. And uh, we have the realization that XML and JSON can be interchangeable if we do some things like respect the order of the fields that we find. We also have JIM and just indexing, which, is, uh, which allows us to perform rapid operations on our data without actually performing a full text search of the actual XML file or JSON which would have been the case before this binary type. So, I said, why don't we uh, create a format which makes actual sense for insertion into a database? And let's create MarkJSON. 
I wasn't, of course, the first one to think of this. But the only reference is a blog post from 2010. And this guy basically tried it and said, yeah, well, I did it. Uh, but it didn't work very well because it didn't take into account field ordering, as we said, which we need. And it doesn't take into account duplicate tags because in JSONB, we cannot have a tag named 001 and another one named 001 as well. So it kind of looks like this. It's, this is the same data file we've already seen, seen in Mark 21 and Mark XML. We define the control fields at the top as JSON tags. And uh, the content remains the same. But in the case where we have a duplicate tag, we have every data field defined as an JSON array, so we can keep the order of the fields, and we can keep the order of the subfields. So we have for tag the problematic tag 210, which we looked at. We have multiple entries under 210, which can have their own indicators and their own subfields, and the subfields can also contain multiple subfields titled A or B or whatever. Let's <clears throat> let's look at what I used for this experiment because, as we said, this is a very practical talk. It's not really I'm not really an expert on either bibliographic data or Postgres, but this is an attempt to make sense out of this chaos. So why not use PG? It's very easy to program for Postgres and Python. It's very fast because it's based on C Python, so it gives you the speed of actually something like you would get from libpq when writing in C. It's a very expressive combination. It lets you type something that looks reasonable, like English and not JDBC code, and you don't waste your time converting between object types because it supports Postgres's data types as closely as it can as Python data types. You need very few lines of code, as we'll see uh, some examples later on, which is very readable code. Now, the, the first problem is, remember that Mark, Mark XML file that we had? Um, I was given a Mark XML file which was 24 unbroken gigabytes, which is not huge for some of the monstrosities you've seen, I'm sure, but it definitely makes DOM not practical because I don't have 24 gigabytes of RAM to load it in. So DOM isn't really needed here because we don't need to access the elements one by one randomly. We just need to parse through the file in order and just load it into a database. So we use what's called streaming XML which is based on the old XPath library, which was one of the first, if not the first, XML library that was open sourced. And uh, this is also known as event-based uh, XML parsing or simple API for XML, depending on the implementation. And uh, I found a very interesting little library called XML to Dict, which lets you read through an XML file um, in DOM mode, and uh, it basically gives you random access over the file, which is loaded, of course, in memory in DOM mode, and uh, it gives you access in the form of Python dicts or dictionaries, which is very handy because it's almost like working with JSON. The formats are very similar. It's very fast, and it has a streaming mode, which we can use. Uh, to avoid lo loading the whole file into memory. So, first of all, to start playing with this, uh, the slides are going to be improved before it goes up on the web, so please forgive me. Um, we install, okay, I use Debian-based system as we can see. 
and specifically Ubuntu because of the pseudo. But looking beyond that, we can see that we need a virtual environment so we can start with a clean environment to play with. Uh, we need Python development packages and we also need the libpq packages in order to install cyclepg. We create, uh, <coughs> excuse me, we create our virtual environment, which we imaginatively titled VE, and uh, then our next step is to activate that Python environment and to upgrade the pip. <coughs> Because sometimes um, PIP doesn't want to bring in the newest Python extensions, so you have to upgrade it uh, from your distributions PIP in order to get uh, compatibility with newer uh, Python eggs. So uh, after we've brought in the latest PIP, then we can PIP install our library, XML to dict, which goes fine. And then we install Psycho PG2, which will fail if you don't have the Python development libraries and if you don't have the development libraries for libpq. But here it doesn't fail, it just throws us some warnings and it's successfully installed, so we can start using it. Let's see now, why do we want the conversion to JSON? Of course, we want to insert it into our database and play with our lovely JSON beat type. But we don't need to actually create a JSON file to do that. We can parse the XML in one go and insert it straight into the database using our Python dicts. I have to remind you that it's 24 gigabytes, which is 6.2 million uh, distinct records. So the only thing we really care about here is throughput. And here comes the Python code. I apologize to people who are not familiar with Python, uh, but it just goes to show you how few lines of code we need to do this thing, and how simple it is to connect it to Postgres, if you haven't seen it before. So we define a Psycho PG connection to our database, with our database being called Mark, out of respect, and uh, our user, which is also called Mark. We set our Postgres isolation level to read uncommitted so that we can insert quickly into the database. We create a cursor, some variables which we'll use in our loops, and a buffer which uses C string IO, which gives you marginally faster operations than Python's uh, strings. Now, since we said it's an event-based library, then we have to define uh, callback handlers for the events that we find, where events are actual XML entities that we come across when we go through the file. So, we write a handler, <coughs> which, uh, because I was bored, I <laughs> defined all the variables we defined as global, and uh, then, we start going through the items. And um, so what it does is treat the XML file as an iterable thing. So it goes through items. And if it finds the leader that is the header that we talked about in Mark 21, it just outputs it. If it finds a control field, then it tries to see uh, if it contains text and then outputs it, and so on. And if it finds a data field, then it starts going through the data field and combing through the subfields that we need, desperately need in order, and uh, puts them in an array. That's all it does. And it's not many lines of code that you actually need. You just need the subcases 
And you need to also include the indicators that we talked about for each subfield. After that, what we need to do is just dump the output that we have, which is Python dictionaries, and we have to dump it into JSON format. But unfortunately, we have to replace the double backslashes with quadruple backslashes because it won't insert properly. So that's a small problem. Uh, we have a basic loop here uh, which tries to batch it into batches of 10,000 records. Um, of course, it doesn't work. It doesn't work properly because you need another iteration of the loop here. You need to copy the code after the loop to take care of the uh, the rest of the uh, the rest of the records that are outside the uh, 10,000 uh, blocks. And that's it. So this is the handler function. It goes through the file and translates it into Python dicts and outputs it as valid JSON. Now, uh, the convert function just opens the file, and you will notice that we need to open it in read binary mode because we don't care uh, if uh, we are to treat it as text or Unicode or anything else. And we just send it to the parse fun function of XML to dict. We do keep our white space because we need it. We do keep our XML attributes because we need them. And uh, we don't need to care about namespaces. And of course, we use the callback, callback function that we defined <coughs> just before that. And uh, this is basically just so you can run it from the command line. And all it does is creates a table called SunCamp with a single column called data, which is of the JSONB type. And it does some timekeeping to see how long it takes. And uh, basically takes a file name of an XML file and does all the work on it. Now let's say we ran this thing for maybe three hours on a desktop and it went through the whole XML file and we've got it loaded as in the JSON type that we defined on our database. So we can access the fields in the subfields, but we must remember that we have JSONB arrays here. So we will not get the results we expect if we query with the arrow operator. So I do select uh, data arrow 245 from Suncat and I just need three rows, I don't want this to run forever. So I get our indicators for each tag, which is called 245, and uh, I can see that I have a tag called subfields, which contains an array, which means that I can't access it directly, which means that I cannot index it, which is our basic goal here. So what do we need for indexing this mass? We need an immutable function because when you try to index the fields, you will get an error saying functions in index expression must be marked immutable. So what's an immutable function? It's a function that doesn't modify your database and it's guaranteed to return the same results for the same input. So we create a function called json to array and uh, it takes in our JSONB data and two uh, strings which describe our levels and it selects subfield A, which we will only care about here, from the JSONB array elements, which is a built-in Postgres function which unrolls your array. And then uh, as a second level, it uh, grabs the JSONB array elements 
from the big array, which is our tag. For example, 210, the tag with multiple instances that we looked at. And we have to uh, name these or else it will fail. And it all gets converted into text and returned as text. It's a simple SQL function. It, we don't need PLPG SQL for this. So, will it blend? Let's see what the function does. When we try to run the function, uh, we select JSON uh, uh, using these four subfields. Why these four? 210, 222, 245, and 246 are subfields where you might encounter a title. They might also be empty, or they might contain uh, string many spaces. So, in order to index them, we just concatenate the whole thing. And we can see that we get some results. So all we do is we tell JSON to array our function, the column that it has to look into, and we tell it the fields to index, the fields to unroll so we can index. Now for uh, text search, we use this thing called the TS vector, which uh, for the English language does some stemming and throws out the uh, the prefix, the, subfix, the suffixes of the words that we don't need and keeps the basic word roots or the stems. So um, we can see that the same results come up as Annuel Rapport, which is French, and uh, festive Magnus program background, Bolivia, country, and so on. So this is actually much more useful for our searches now. We can also look at the new extension called PG Trigram, which looks at, thanks Joe, which looks at trigrams, and uh, trigrams are basically three-letter groups of our string. And by comparing these groups, we can also compare strings and see how similar they are to each other. So it goes off the screen, ignore it, and uh, we can see that it's, breaking our, it's broken down our strings into trigrams, and it's also taking care of the concatenation thing, which we don't care about. We need to search through all the titles. So how do we index? We just increase our maintenance work memory because uh, you don't want to do that with the defaults. It will take ages. So I give it a reasonably large amount of RAM to play with when creating the gen index, which needs a lot of RAM. And why not two gigabytes? Because we only live once. Uh, we don't want to wait for ages. And uh, for this to take effect, you have to restart the server. So we create our index, and it takes around six minutes to index 6.2 million records, which isn't bad uh, for a TS vector index. Our trigram index takes a bit more. It takes about, this is on the desktop machine, it's nothing fancy. It takes about seven minutes to create the index on the fields that we care about, the title fields. And uh, now we'll test them and see if this thing works. Um, sorry for the screenshots. This is going to become actual text in the final slides so that they can appear in search results and uh, be optimal and so on. So we select uh, our JSON array elements. What is 049? Our 049, in this case, is the SOMCAT identifier. It identifies a single uh, category of serials. So the American Journal of Psychology would have all its issues under the same SOMCAT ID. Then we grab the title field, 245, and then we grab the rank. TS rank is a function which 
uh, returns only the things that you're searching for, which in this case, uh, by using plain to TS query, we just enter a string to search for. And this string has to be in the English language, so we can use the same stemming rules. And it says the American Journal of Psychology. So uh, our condition is to search for the string, the American Journal of Psychology, and we want an extra column called rank, which shows us how similar it was to what we searched for. And we get results like this. Some cat ID, the title, which in the first instance happens to be outside the 245 field. So we might find it in the 222 or 210, so it doesn't match when we uh, do a select distinct. But we get very useful, accurate results here. And the rank is just a number. Ignore it. It doesn't have to be 0.9 to match. So let's explain this. And we can see that we use the index here. It uses a bitmap index. It uses a recheck condition so that it matches our filter, and then it does a bitmap heap scan, which is even faster. It means that it doesn't even go through the whole index, it just throws out what cannot match on our index, which is basically the fastest kind of uh, indexing performance you can get. The same query for our trigrams. <coughs> Let's see why would it, we would need to test for both. Uh, the first query would match everything that is relevant to psychology. But this will take care of misspellings. So if you misspell psychology, then it will bring you useful results. However, it will bring you also the American Journal of Pathology, which you don't want. So we need to combine both queries to make sure that we don't get any false positives. And we define the similarity that we require to be above 0 0.7, so it doesn't bring you any irrelevant results, which also delays our query. And we can see that the trigram query also uses a bitmap index scan and the bitmap heap scan. So it's also going to be fast. It is not as fast as the other one. But the combined query is fast because we've already thrown out uh, the irrelevant things such as pathology from the TS query. And it just keeps getting bigger and bigger the more you look into it. And I've been told by librarians that there are also other fields where title might be. And uh, so, uh, we get the same results when we explain this gigantic query as well. And why don't we write a lovely function to go with it? So that we can just uh, run the function with the string and it will give us back useful results. So, um, <coughs> let me see if I can run this as an example. Can you see the text? Um, What did I call the function? Suncat query. So, let's see. Remember, this is a six year old laptop. And, uh, these aren't useful results, so let's change to extended display. And uh, there you go. This is how this uh, monster query function returns our results. We get all the four title fields that we look for, and in some cases they contain gibberish or just abbreviations, uh, but we do get uh, useful results. Why do we get useful results? We uh, decided to give some 
the weight to each of the algorithms that we used. So I'm using the TS query rank with the option 32, which uh, brings it to the scale 0 to 1. And this is already on the scale of 0 to 1. So I just uh, add them <coughs> and divide by 2. And I will get something which is less than 1. So I hope I haven't confused you very much. This is my Twitter handle. You, uh, you'll be able to find the slides here. And uh, shortly, in the next couple of weeks, we will have the, the Adina developer blogs will become public. So you can see what we're actually working on uh, for this project and other projects that Adina is working with relating to library and bibliographic data. And the slides are also going to go up on SlideShare. Uh, if I haven't bored you to death, I can take your questions now. It seems to me that you explained uh, this whole format change that is uh, trying to be as much as possible reversible so that you can go back to the original format, maybe minus some white space things. Exactly. This is and that you put that in a database uh, and that you then do, when you do the query, you have this monster query that every time you do a query, it's th this, this, again, minus, of course, the fact that uh, some some uh, some indexing has been done before. This uh, is what, just what is an the example. It's yeah. not a really useful query yeah, for but, production. Yeah, but what's the benefit to that compared to another approach that would be to try to do at insert time some number normalization over all the possible ways that mark can be uh, can be interpreted and then have your query somewhat the thing more, is you more your changeable. thanks for the question the, the data always changes so you will get a different mark xml file every week or so so you will have to parse through it and do inserts or up updates or upserts into your database, which takes a very, very long time. Um, but it's not really clear when you will receive the update. It might take a week, it might take a month. And uh, it's, you're basically using structured data, so you're not better off breaking it down into columns because you don't know how many subfields you have, and you'll have the same problems indexing it as with the JSON. This just does it in 25 rows. Um, have I answered or gone around your question? I think somewhat. Yeah, answered it somewhat. I mean, I understand the fact that you get updates all the time, but uh, I mean, you, most of the data will be just redoing to that. I, don't, I, I still think that some normalization could help at the time that you really have the query you need it to be fully reversible because you want uh, Suncat also outputs the original Mark 21 field, okay. which is reconstructed. Uh, because some librarians find it useful to look at the actual format, more useful actually than looking at plain text. You mentioned that the XML file was corrupted. How did you correct it, or how did you? sanitize the export from the sources? Um, that's actually being taken care of before I get the XML file. And some people go through it by hand, if you believe it or not, and uh, find discrepancies. And uh, also, you, you can see that when it breaks Zebra, which tries to index it, and when it breaks Aleph, so you can find out easily where the problems are in the XML data. But generally, yeah, there's uh, software before that which produces the actual Mark XML file. Um, are you aware of uh, projects? Hi, uh, are you aware of projects like um, we we do? Uh, I work for a small company that made a project for the French uh, Bibliothèque Nationale (BNF). We expose uh, several databases as uh, ones. Uh, exporting using the semantic web uh, yeah. APIs. So, so we, we, do, we don't do this kind of stuff because we do import the data uh, 
once or twi twice a year, something like that. We do normalization at the entrance, we do machine learning to actually try to prevent uh, human interventions in these steps. Uh, are you aware of these kind of projects and where, how, how can they be related or interesting compared to what you're doing? Well, we can talk after this. <laughs> uh, I, I'm, not, I'm not one of the developers of the project, so I'm not very aware. No, of I wasn't very aware of it. I was, just, I was just looking at what Suncat was doing with solar. And they said, you can only use solar to search through this data. I said, no, you, that you don't have to. You can also run a Postgres query, which will return in something like 17 milliseconds. And this is what I was trying to prove here, that using a database for database-related stuff is good. <laughs> Thank you. I will, I will look into that. So uh, out of curiosity, you mentioned that uh, there is this Mark XML that is this uh, monstrosity thing. Uh, you, can you use uh, actually uh, XPath or something like that, or it use something like look that looks like XML? Uh, it has to be valid XML so that I can use the XML to do the library. Uh, you could write a parser for it, but why? You could also write a parser for Mark Twenty One, and this is how X Libras make their money. But you don't want to do that. to have it loaded somewhere. Oh. You will need 24 gigabytes of storage to go through the file. Um, I find the technical part of it quite, I find the technical part quite interesting, but have you thought anything about how the ideal model would be used defining the data? That could be the next talk. <laughs> this is just, you know, the experimental stage. Uh, of course, you can uh, use things like this to create interfaces. As we said, uh, librarians have their own protocols and interfaces called SRU and uh, Z3950, and you can use them to write Postgres extensions which can answer in these formats. <laughs> so that is one considerable way to go forward. So we could get rid of the middleware servers. Okay, thank you very much.